Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our second virtual learning experience. We're so glad that you're here. We've got an exciting guest with us today, and I'm so glad that she's uh, here and we've got rid of all of our technical issues. Uh, we never know when we're going to have technical issues, but that's okay. She's here and she's live with us from New York City, and I just kind of want to kind of do a little quick overview. So, uh, teachers, if you have student questions, feel free to enter them in the chat, and we're going to relay those questions to our guest when we, she comes on in just a second. And we want to thank everyone for being here, and we've got more information about our other t uh, virtual learning experiences a little bit later, but I want to first uh, introduce our speaker today. This is Janice Dean, and she's had a busy weekend. She was uh, at the Preakness, and I saw her tweets live on the Preakness this weekend, and she's Senior Meteorologist for Fox News, and she's been there since 2004, but she's written some interesting books for children on weather phenomenon, and that's why I kind of came across her name and started following her on Twitter, and so I just want to introduce Janice Dean. Uh, with us and thank you Janice for being with us. Ah, oh, thank you so much John and thanks for bearing with me with the technological issues. Uh, we've learned a lot in the past two years with the pandemic how to adjust right and so I thank you for being patient. So go ahead Janice take it away. All right well I, I appreciate everybody joining in today. Um, my name is Janice Dean and I've been at Fox News since 2004. So this is my 18th year uh, and I've been predicting weather, forecasting weather here for, uh, for that duration of time. When I graduated from school, I knew that I wanted to be in broadcasting. Uh, my mom will tell you that ever since I was probably five or six years old, I would go out in the community, in the neighborhood, and I would interview neighbors and ask them what they were up to, uh, what TV shows they liked, and maybe what the weather was going to be like in the next couple of days. So, uh, you know, I think I always knew I wanted to do something in broadcasting. The weather aspect of it came a little bit later on in my career. Um, but when I first started out, I took radio, television, broadcasting in college. Uh, and I got my first job at a radio station. I was a weekend events reporter going around the neighborhood. I grew up in Canada, in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, the capital of Canada. Uh, and I used to go around uh, to different community events and report live from my little sun scoop vehicle. And a lot of it actually had to do with outdoor weather. You know, I would go out to the teddy bear picnic uh, or I would go to the local car wash if there was a, a, you know, a big event happening where they were trying to raise money. Um, so I would start reporting on the weather that day, you know, what the weather was going to be like for these various community events. So that started off early. And when I was at the radio station, I would do a lot of uh, TV events for that radio station. And one of the local news directors said to me one day, well, you know, you, you do well on television. People seem to like you. Have you ever thought about doing more of it? And so while I was working at the radio station, uh, they asked me if I wanted to be a part-time weather forecaster for the local meteorologist when he went on vacation. So I was always doing weather either part-time or on the side throughout my career. And when I got to Fox, uh, they needed a daytime weather person and asked me if I had ever done weather before. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I did right out of college, right during my first job in broadcasting. And so while at Fox, I went back to school to become a broadcast meteorologist. So I always say you're, you're never too old to learn something new. And I really enjoy doing the weather uh, because it's something that connects all of us. We all experience the weather. It can start a conversation with somebody. Hey, how you doing? What's the weather like in your area? Uh, and while doing this, I used to go out to a lot of schools and teach kids about weather. And I always thought to myself, I wonder if there's any good books that I can recommend to kids, because a lot of teachers and parents would ask me for good recommendations uh, to teach kids about how weather works. And there wasn't a whole lot out there. So I thought to myself, 
maybe I can do that. Maybe I can write children's weather books. Uh, so I did that. I started uh, writing in 2013 and I've written five weather books concentrating on Freddie the Frog Caster who loves doing the weather and has a part-time job on the Frog News Network with his friends Sally Croker and Polly Woggins. Uh, and so I started out with just Freddie the Frogcaster about Freddie learning about a thunderstorm and warning uh, the town that a, that a thunderstorm was going to uh, maybe bring their picnic indoors. So that was my first book. And then from there, I did Freddie the Frogcaster and the Flash Flood, uh, teaching kids about what a flash flood is and how to prepare for it. Uh, Freddie the Frogcaster and the Terrible Tornado. Uh, which is timely right now because we're into severe weather season. So it teaches kids how to prepare for a tornado if you live in an area that gets tornadoes. Um, and, you know, one interesting part of that is any place on earth can get a tornado, but there are some areas that are more prone to tornadoes than others. And then I did Freddie the Frogcast for the huge hurricane. Uh, hurricane season is coming up June 1st. That's the official start date. So that's a timely book as well if you live in areas that can be affected by hurricanes. And then Freddie the Frogcaster and the Big Blizzard. Uh, so th that was a th that's a book close to my heart because uh, growing up in Canada, we had a lot of uh, snowstorms and blizzards. So um, those are the five books that I wrote about Freddie and his adventures covering the weather. Uh, and I love it. I, I love that I am able to communicate with kids and teachers and not only, you know, talk about Freddie and his love of weather, but at the back of the book, there's always um, a section that kind of goes in depth as to, you know, why weather happens. Uh, you know, what's a thermometer? What's a rain gauge? What's a weather vane? What's a barometer? Um, so not only did I want to do a fun story, I also wanted, you know, teachers and kids to, you know, dive into more weather related terms uh, in meteorology if they if they wanted to do so. So that's kind of an introduction about what I do and and uh, and how I love teaching kids about the weather and going out to schools. Uh, it's something that uh, I probably enjoy most of all about my job is going out and and teaching kids about about why weather happens. So Janice, um, I know that you've written these great books and you know we're we have to prepare for hurricane season because we live in South Florida yep. and so we're very much aware of hurricane season. We get a few tornadoes, but nothing like what they do in the Midwest. So uh, we haven't had any seen questions yet, but I'm sure they'll pop up any second now. But why I think it's great that you tell stories about the weather because a lot of books are just informational only and but I love it when it's written in a story where did you come up with the concept of Freddie that's a good question so when I started wanting to write a children's book about weather I started with my experience as a kid you know being afraid of a thunderstorm uh so the first the first draft of a book was about a little girl that was afraid of a thunderstorm. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a good lesson. And if you really want to do something, uh, just keep trying over and over. Because um, I went to one publishing um, a publisher who said, well, we like the idea of children's weather books, but we don't really think that your story about a little girl in a thunderstorm is, you know, is all that. Uh, exciting. And I, I was disheartened by that because I thought it was a great idea and a great story. Um, but then they said to me that kids sometimes, um, you know, identify more with animals. Uh, so I, again, went back to the drawing board and thought to myself, okay, what animals do I love and what would I be able to tell a story uh, with? And so I've always had a fascination with frogs. I love frogs. And while I was doing some research, I learned that frogs are nature's forecasters. Uh, in some areas, they croak louder when they feel changes in the atmosphere. And it's sort of a warning sign that something is, is coming. So I thought to myself, wow, okay, frogs might be uh, you know, a really good place to start. And then I started using, thinking to myself, okay, frog 
frog casting, broadcasting. Um, and then I thought about all these great names like Polly Woggins and Sally Croker and the Frog News Network. So it kind of sort of all came together. But what I do tell students is that it wasn't overnight. Uh, you know, my idea of writing children's books took many years of uh, rejection and people tell me, well, I don't know if I like that idea. Why don't you try this idea? And then, you know, trying to do it again, like, you know, going back to the drawing board and saying, OK, well, I'm going to take their advice and I'm going to write about a frog. Uh, and then it took a couple of uh, different publishers as well to finally sort of hop on board uh, to my frog casting idea. But when I finally got somebody to say, yes, I like your idea, um, it took about 10 years, you know, from the idea of a children's book to actually publishing one. Uh, it took a very long time and uh, it took a lot of patience and it took a lot of, uh, you know, believing in myself and my idea and finding the right person to say, yes, I, I believe in you too. So um, that's kind of how it all began. And then the publishing company, Regnery, that, that liked the idea, found my illustrator, uh, Russ Cox, who I think is amazing. So, you know, it's one thing to tell a story, but you really need somebody to, um, you know, uh, make the, make the, make the story come to life. And so Fred, um, rather, um, Russ Cox is the one that, you know, did all five books with me and really made Freddie come to life in the story. So I'm really proud of that. So uh, we've got two questions so far. That, that one of them is about the books, but uh, we have this one that asks, which state has the most tornadoes? That's a very good question. We actually have a whole region uh, that is called Tornado Alley. Um, and that's where all of the ingredients come together for you know, pretty big tornadoes, especially during the changing of the season. So we have two uh, tornado seasons, one in the fall and one in the spring. And as I mentioned, tornadoes can happen anywhere, right? Um, but they have to have sort of this, this, um, this uh, perfect ingredients in that you have to have cold air and warm air and the clash of those two um, air masses will bring you the, the potential for severe storms, including tornadoes. And where we have the all of those ingredients that come together during the changes of the season is places like Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Arkansas, Missouri. Um, you know, if you if you Google Tornado Alley, it'll show you this big area across the south. And and we get more tornadoes in Tornado Alley in the U.S. than any other place on Earth. Uh, it just happens that, you know, we've got the Gulf of Mexico uh, very close by. And then you when you have that cold air that comes in from Canada, when you have the changing of the seasons, you know, those two clashes uh, as a cold front sort of crashes into that warm air, that warm, unstable air mass, that's where we tend to get the most tornadoes. But we've had tornadoes in New York. Uh, we had a tornado, I think, just last week in New Hampshire. Um, but we don't get the really violent storms that Tornado Alley can get. You know, um, we have a criteria of storms, uh, uh, a scale of them. We go from EF1 to EF5. Uh, and, you know, last night, actually, I was reporting on a tornado in Texas uh, that was, I think, at least a mile wide. It was huge. Um, so, again, uh, that particularly uh, particular place in the U.S., Tornado Alley, is when we typically get uh, the most tornadoes and some of the most violent tornadoes that, that you can get. Um. Allison Berkeley is asking, were you nervous about predicting weather when you first started? I still get nervous, actually. I always say that I think being nervous means you want to do a good job. I don't think being nervous is a bad thing. I think the day that you're not nervous is maybe the day that you maybe you should try something new. Uh, now, I'm not saying that every single day I go on television, I'm nervous, uh, but I do get those butterflies and they come when I have a really important uh, story to tell, like when it is tornado season or hurricane season. And I realize that I want to do a really good job to make sure that people know where the dangerous weather is going to be because, you know, weather forecasters can have a lot of fun on TV, but we're also in charge of giving really important weather information, safety information that can save lives. So um, when it comes to that important job, you know, I get a little bit nervous because I really want to do a good job and I want to make sure that 
you know, moms and dads and teachers uh, and, and kids that are watching are preparing in advance for a potential storm. Um, you know, when I do something new, I get to do a lot of fun stuff doing the weather. Uh, as you mentioned, John, I was out at the Preakness, which is one of the big horse races in Baltimore. Um, and I get to do the weather out there because that's really important for sporting events, outdoor sporting events. You know, when I'm doing something like that and I'm interviewing somebody important or um, if I'm doing something brand new, I always get the little nervous butterfly flies. But I think that that's really, that's, that's an important part of it. It's just because you want to do a good job. Right, right. So um, here's a good one right here. Can tornadoes form in water? It's from a second grade classroom. That's a really good question. Yes, there are tornadoes that, I mean, living in Florida, they're called water spouts. And it's the same dynamics as a tornado. And actually, the really cool part is that if you have a tornado over water, a water spout, if it comes over land, then it's classified as a tornado. So yes, tornadoes can form over water and they are called water spouts. Yeah, we've seen quite a few of those. There was a one years ago that was formed right off of Miami and you could see the towers and stuff like that. And so that was a really cool thing. Um, here's another good question about tornadoes. Which state has the least tornadoes? Mm, that's a very good question. I would probably say any of the Northern states like New Hampshire, or a Vermont, or a Maine, uh, even, you know, the Northwest, like in and around the Seattle area, they do get tornadoes, um, but they're not as prevalent or, or as often as you would say, see in a place like uh, Tornado Alley, like Texas or Oklahoma or Kansas or Missouri uh, or Louisiana. So I would say the more North you go, uh, the less likely you are going to have tornadoes. But as I mentioned, every state can have tornadoes. They're just uh, usually not as violent as the ones you would typically get down south. Okay. And here comes another one. Uh, how do you predict the weather? How do I predict the weather? Well, I have a lot of help. Uh, you know, the good thing about weather these days is the technology is getting better. So we're able to have a lot more tools uh, to forecast. For instance, I look at, you know, satellite, which are, which are basically cloud presentation from, from space. Uh, and then I have radar, which um, you look at a map, it shows where the precipitation is on a map. We have, um, uh, you know, more and more ways to identify clouds and precipitation. Uh, we have trained weather spotters uh, across the U.S. who uh, whose job it is is to measure how much rainfall their their neighborhood got and and to report it from the nat to the National Weather Service. Um, so we have a lot of help these days, and with you know the technology that we have now, we have more people who are able to broadcast you know the weather in their area. Um, we also rely on meteorologists with the National Weather Service, you know, they're very helpful. We have a lot of you know, computer models that we look at to do five day forecasts. They're not just one, there's several computer models that we will look at. Uh, and that's the inputting in, of information of temperature, of wind speed, uh, where a storm is going to go. We look at the jet stream, the, you know, the winds at the higher levels of the atmosphere, uh, sort of the pathway where all these storms kind of travel. Um, so I will say that, you know, when you look back 50 years, ago, we didn't have the capability that we have today of detecting storms and being able to know where a storm is going to go, uh, especially hurricanes now, right? I mean, the great thing about hurricane technology is we can see the storms when they're out in the Atlantic because of the satellites that we have, right? Um, and then we also have, you know, instruments. We rely on um you know, storm chasers that go out and, and watch tornadoes and give us information and, and have like instrumentation that they put ahead of a tornado or a severe storm to give us more data on how these things happen. Uh, and then we also have um, hurricane hunters that go out in planes and go out in hurricanes and, and drop, uh, you know, tools, drop sons is what they're called, uh, into the eye of the hurricane to see where the winds, the different level of winds in the hurricane are. So, um, you know, it, it really takes a lot of people and the technology to to um, give the a very accurate forecast, which is what we're, you know, these days we, we can see five days out uh, pretty well where we think the trajectory of a hurricane is going to to move into land. 
Yes, and we look at those forecasts very frequently when we live in South Florida. Yes. Uh, the spaghetti models of all the computer models is another good way of looking at things like that. Yes. All right. Here is another good question. What was the biggest tornado in Florida? Would you Do you know that? I don't. That's a really good question. Um, Usually we don't get many powerful her tornadoes in Florida, get, but we do get them. Yeah. I mean, the most powerful hurricane in Florida was um, Andrew. And I think this is the 30th anniversary coming up of Hurricane Andrew. Oh, yeah, it is. Yep. And then we had Michael too, Hurricane Michael. Uh, that was just a couple of years ago. Um, so even though I couldn't tell you what the most powerful tornado was, there have been several very powerful hurricanes in Florida that, you know, that are historic. Yeah. And that ties into another question right there was which state has the most record recorded hurricanes? I think it's Florida. I think it might be Florida. Yeah. Uh, I would probably say that's probably true. But you guys have had hurricanes as far as New York. Of course, we had Hurricane Sandy. Uh, yeah. This will be the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Sandy. Um, we had her as a tropical storm. Yes, yes. Um, and, you know, that was a really good forecast. I mean, obviously not good in the way because it caused so much destruction. But I remember forecasting Sandy 10 years ago when the storm was, um, you know, in the Bahamas. And I could see three or four days out that, that it was going to come up the East Coast and then make a left-hand curve right into New York. So we knew pretty soon, um, you know, before it happened, and we could warn a lot of folks. But the thing is, is that New York doesn't typically see like the big, really strong hurricanes, although we have had, had them. We've had like a Category 3, maybe close to a 4 in our history um, towards Long Island. Uh, but Hurricane Sandy was um, was a, a kind of a hybrid of a hurricane and a nor'easter. So that's what made it quite different than just your regular hurricane. It was interacting with a cold front that made it, uh, we called it a superstorm actually, uh, because it had had the characteristics of both a hurricane and a nor'easter, a perfect storm that really did make its left hand hook into uh, New York, New Jersey, uh, we had damage in Connecticut, um, you know, really scraped uh, the coastline. Uh, and some places are still, you know, uh, rebuilding 10 years later. So it really, it caused a lot of damage, a lot of tremendous flooding along the coast. Um, parts of uh, lower Manhattan were completely underwater. Yeah, I remember seeing the video of the subway system where the water was just pouring in, flooding the subway system. Yep. So that's a lot of water pushing up that way. Okay. So um, how many tornadoes can ha usually happen in one place at a time? Oh, well, that's another good question. Um, we can have multiple tornadoes. Um, you know, Texas has been really active this year. Um, and when you have multiple tornadoes, you can have like dozens of tornadoes, or you can have one big tornado that lasts a very long time and is counted as different tornadoes. That's why the National Weather Service, after there have been an outbreak of tornadoes, they always go out and assess the damage and make a report because sometimes it can be exactly the same tornado, but it just hits different areas. And tornadoes can travel hundreds of miles. I think one of the longest tornadoes, you know, started uh, across the, the Plain States and went all the way up towards uh, the the Great Lakes region. It went hundreds and hundreds of miles. So they they can they can cross over states, multiple states, and last for hours. Yeah, we had a, a tornado that uh, hit not too far from here a few a weeks ago, where at um, the National Weather Service came out because it was hit near one of our high schools and it threw some of the uh, tree, uh, field and tr uh, track equipment across the street. And so um, they were out there to determine, you know, what kind of, if it was a real uh, tornado or what. So, yeah, mm -hmm. you never know. Um, is it hard to predict the weather? Also, how long does it take to predict the weather? <laughs> is it hard to predict the weather? Well, like I mentioned, it's getting better. We're getting better. I will always say past five days, it's a little tough. You know, like I would say a three-day forecast is fairly solid, but there are times, I will tell you, especially in the winter, 
where we still sometimes will predict six or seven inches of snow and we wake up the next morning and my kids are like, mom, there's no snow on the ground. What happened? Uh, so sometimes, you know, the forecast doesn't go as planned, uh, but we are getting better. We are getting better with the, with the details. Um, but you know, you can, it's hard. Like for instance, I can give you an area where we think a storm is going to move into, but when it comes to predicting, you know, tornadoes or thunderstorms, it's really hard to pinpoint the exact location where a thunderstorm is going to open up. You know, New York might get a, a, a big thunderstorm. And then where I live on Long Island, the thunderstorm might move northward or eastward or even might weaken and we might not get any of it. So that's the part that's really hard. I can give you a good indication of where a storm um, is going to move into. But when it comes to the little tiny details of the exact town, the exact county of who's going to get the worst, especially when it comes to flooding, something like a flash flood, that's really hard to predict. Um, but for me, I just give folks the region where we think the storms are going to come through. And then it's kind of up to the mom and the dad and the teacher and the school board to, you know, discuss, to, to, to discuss, are we in an area that we think we are probably going to get hit by something? And, and so for me, it's to give you guys the best information that I have from all of the places that I mentioned, the National Weather Service, we have we have meteorologists here at Fox News, many of them um, that help me put together a forecast. So um, so it's it's not always going to be 100 percent accurate. Let's just say that. Yeah, I think we all kind of get, get that because you, things change really fast. You never yep. know. But it's also good sometimes, you know, you think the storm is going to come and you're ready for it. You've got your umbrella and you see sunny skies and you're like, okay, the forecaster was wrong, but I'm okay with that. Yeah, in Florida, we get rain no matter what. It's just, yes. you know, it just can happen really out of the blue. So I just carry an umbrella with me. Usually okay. that keeps the rain away. Good. So, uh Here's a good question. What is the deadliest hurricane ever? The deadliest hurricane ever. Well, uh, I would say that was Hurricane Katrina. And that happened in Louisiana uh, in 2005. And I, and I covered that storm. Um, and it was because of the flooding. So that was a Category 5 hurricane at one point, uh, Katrina. And then when it made landfall on the coast of Louisiana, uh, Mississippi, it was a category three. So even though the storm downgraded to a three, it still had a storm surge of a category five storm, which means I think at one point we had a 30 foot storm surge, which would put, you know, homes and towns underwater. Uh, and what happened in New Orleans was the storm came through and everyone thought that it was was fine, but then the levees broke in New Orleans and New Orleans is shaped like a bowl. So people live in these very low lying areas and the levees are there to protect, to pump out all the water that that will you know, come in, not, not with just a hurricane, like a, a, just a thunderstorm can produce a lot of heavy rainfall. So they have a pumping system that pumps out all the water. Well, the levees broke after Hurricane Katrina, and that's why we had so many uh, lives lost. I think over a thousand lives were lost in, in the New Orleans area. Yeah, that was a sad one for sure. Um, one question was a couple of questions back about which book took you the longest to write? Hmm. The first one, the first book, because the first like, one, it was trial and error, wasn't it? It really was. And, you know, I, I really tell people that if you have a dream of doing something, um, just keep trying because that's a really good example of, I could have been really discouraged. And I was, I was, cause I thought this, I had this great idea of this little girl that was afraid of a thunderstorm and her dad helped her understand why they happened. Um, and then they just, you know, the, the, the publishers were very kind, but they kept saying, well, you know, I think you should, like I said, try an animal, maybe do a different situation. And, you know, and I kept trying and they kept saying, well, that's not what we really want. And then I got that rejection letter in the mail, right? Like I opened it up and it said, you know, we're it's just not a good fit right now, but you know, keep trying. And I put it away for a while because I think I was really discouraged, but I always kept coming back to it. Like, I know I have a good idea, you know? And, and so when I had my two 
kids. Uh, and I started reading books to them. That's kind of when I sort of realized that they were right, uh, that, that, that maybe they did know what they were talking about and that I shouldn't take it so personally. Um, so yeah, the first book took a long time to write because it took a long time for me to find a person that believed in me and, and the story. Well, you picked a good character. I really liked the character. And I think Frog was the perfect one being an amphibious kind of animal and stuff like that. So uh, we're going to wrap things up, Janice, with you. But we have one more question. There are a cool. lot of teachers that are wondering about your shoes. <laughs> oh, that. Oh, I love it. Of course. So um, this is my this is my office, actually. And uh, inside is where, uh, where I have all my clothes for work. So no one asked how early I get up in the morning. That's usually a question I get. Um, so I do the morning show and I'm up every morning at 3 a.m. And, and, and I organize myself like I'm a, a, you know, a student at school where I put all of my clothes the night before out. So when I get up, I get dressed, I make my coffee, I brush my teeth, and then I come into work and all my work clothes are here. So when I come in, like I'm dressed up nice today because I knew I had to talk to you guys, but I usually come in in like track pants and a t-shirt because all my good clothes are here at work. So yes, you see all of those. I'll take a picture if you want. I'll take a picture once we're done and I'll send it to all, all the teachers that want to see my, my shoe collection. Th these shoes, some of these shoes are 18 years old. So uh, I, you know, if I find a really good pair of shoes, I don't get rid of it. I actually will buy more colors of that shoe uh, to, to, to keep in my office. So yeah, um, I do have a very nice shoe collection, but they're not brand new shoes. That's for sure. <laughs> oh yeah. That was kind of one of the first things some of the people started asking were about your shoes. And so I wanted to throw that at the end. Okay. One more question that came out that was, I think it's really good. What is one way to get out of a tornado? And that, I think that's really important because in, in Florida, you never know what kind of weather we're going to have very quickly. And I think that's really cool. And I'm sure you've addressed that in your book. Yeah. I mean, it's really important to know what to do when there's a watch or a warning for a tornado. So when you see a watch on TV, that means conditions are favorable for tornadoes. And that means you need to start thinking about what am I going to do if there's a warning of a tornado? And what a warning means is that we've either spotted a tornado on Doppler radar or we've had a report of a tornado in the area. And that's when you want to have a way to get those reports you know, um, the TV is always a good idea, but what if the power goes out, right? So that's why I always say to have a NOAA weather radio, and that's a radio where you have batteries and you can still hear the warnings that are coming in. Um, the blessed, best place when you have a tornado is the basement. If you have a basement or if you don't have a basement, you need to be in an interior room away from the windows. So uh, when you think of your house, you want to make sure that you're in the most protected area. And usually I say that's a bathroom. Um, and away from the windows. And also we tell people to get in their bathtub. And if you can bring pillows or a mattress on top of you, you know, you want to be as far away from the tornado as possible and as underground as you possibly can be. Um, now, when it comes to flooding, that's the opposite, right? If there's a flood, you want to be at the highest level of your home. Um, so you really have to know what, uh, you know, what type of storm is coming. Um, and so when it's come, when it comes to a tornado, the lowest portion of your home or the most interior section of your house, like a bathroom where you're away from, you know, you're away from the, you know, the tornado. Yeah. We don't have any basements in South Florida, but we do, there are some that, uh, that have them, which is kind of a weird thing, but they do have them. So yeah, well, that's the best thing. The schools too need to have storm shelters, you know, as, as, uh, as teachers, you have to know where you're going to put your students if there's a tornado warning. So, um, you know, I know that Florida is pretty well set up. If you don't have a basement, then, you know, you, you have to be able to know that you're going to go that to air, that interior room in your home away from those windows. Yeah, a lot of our schools have been redesigned since 2004 when we had that uh, that really active hurricane season because we have, uh, you know, our schools are hurricane shelters and there are lots of uh, protection stuff like that. And so, well, Janice, we want to thank you for being here. It was a great pleasure to have you. And I'm so thankful that our kids and our, our teachers got to hear from you. And for those of you that don't know, there's Freddie the Frogcaster has an app 
that uh, works on predicting the weather too. So if next year when you're in the weather units, you can also use that app to project, uh, help you predict the weather. And so that's a really good tool. So thank you, for Janice, for being here. And we'll, uh, we're gonna start closing things out. And uh, we wanna let you know that we have a few other virtual learning experiences coming up. Today at one o'clock, we're gonna hear from Ranger Michael, who's from Yellowstone National Park. And he is going to be joining us and talking about what's it like to work at Yellowstone, at one of our nation's oldest national parks. And then tomorrow we have our friends at the Norton Art Museum that are gonna be talking about traveling the world with the Norton. So we wanna keep you sticking around. Uh, that's tomorrow at one o'clock. Our, uh, we have supporting details with our website uh, on our edtechtraining.pymeschools.org. If you click on the 2022 Spring Virtual Learning Experiences, you can actually see resources that are related to each one of these. We'll post examples of the books and stuff like that in Freddie the Frogcaster um, website on the on today for Janice, and then we'll have more resources for the other ones. Uh, we want to thank everyone for sticking with us uh, from everybody on the training team and the entire technology training department. We want to thank you for joining us and we hope you have a great week and a great summer and we look forward to serving you in the future. Thank you.